So it has all become down to this. I really didn't want to make this video. But I did! Hi everybody, welcome to the Dire Gentleman channel, it's me, Gus Zagarella. <laughs> and I'm Masters in Animation Meg Tootin, the creator of Tooth or Dare, a wonderful, yes. uh, uh, awesome uh, short thing that I definitely made. Yep, yep, you definitely went to grad school and... and spend it you're getting that degree we can we can unfreaky friday this we like, can yeah quick. no you know who we are you know who we you know who <laughs> it is and what it does um uh i gotta so gus and i are here to revisit one of my favorite personal um what's the word what's the word it's it's the way that you are with like jordan peterson oh like a member of uh a member of the rogues gallery yeah a member Tootin of rogues the rogues gallery. gallery but also like sort of a sort of like a favorite subject like, this is my puzzle box, you know, to, to bring it back to Hellraiser, a topic that all of you in the in the audience will definitely know about if you're a fan of Dire Gentlemen. Yeah, this is like my puzzle box. This is just something that I, I have been wanting to decipher for at least the past year, and that is John Enter. Yeah, the mysterious Mr. Enter himself, who, to, to go off what you said, is a bit like a creative foil to you. Like, it's somebody who, yeah. you look at the way they do things in terms of, like, their creative output, and you're like... Hmm, at one point, maybe I saw some things in this that I wanted to do, but now, not the case anymore. <laughs> this is me in a darker timeline. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I yeah. completely understand that. <laughs> We've been talking about this for a while because I, I am, like, obsessed with growing around. It is, <laughs> it's, it's such a weird little tragic, terrifying, non-thing I don't even know how to describe it because it's like it's like a series of unproduced scripts on a wiki because Mr. Renter deleted them all off of DeviantArt but they're all still up on the wiki and it's also a book and I think they were going to make a comic at one point but I don't know if they've scrapped that but apparently like we went on his channel to watch his uh Enter the Interverse <laughs> video mm. um which was basically just him saying that he's back on social media and he has like a social media guy now He's still working on growing around, but he talks about it like it's already been made. Which it hasn't. Like, it's just this weird thing that, like, there was that Shorty McShort shorts with, like, the parents and kids switching, mm. and he decided... Flip-flopped. Flip-flopped, yeah. So he was like, yeah. this is such a good idea. I know. How about, like, 80-plus episodes? Like, an epic length... I think he wrote 175 scripts. Jeez, yeah. It's just, like, Lord of the, Wing Lord of the Rings dwarfing, Homestuck approaching, like epic length like show that is supposed to be also like it's a standalone comedy episode show but it also doesn't shy away from like dark issues which yeah he, th which he he loves to describe the show like sort of semi facetiously as Bo bojack horseman for kids which is definitely what kids need yeah <laughs> the, th the thing too is that like you look at the like absurdity of the premise that enter himself has never explained to date and then you imagine that world with like real world politics in it and like real world like issues in it and you're like yeah. how can it be coherently explored in any possible way yeah. without even getting into how mr enter interprets these real world issues in his own like political framework yeah it's 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 mind-boggling <laughs> yeah so um i made a video i'll throw it up here it is called The Existential Nightmare of Growing Around. I basically did like a sort of, okay, so I'm going to read a couple of scripts of Growing Around, um, listen to a review of the book, and I'm going to sort of like armchair uh, psychoanalyze John Enter based on it. Yeah. Uh, basically, that's what I did. I was like sort of laying out why like the world building is really like weird and terrifying. Mm. Uh, and you know, like I didn't go too much, but I didn't go too much in the actual production on it because, you know, um, uh, Daft Pina and Just Stop did their own videos that Just Stops was just about Mr. Enter in general, but Daft Pina's was specifically about the production, like the cursed production of Growing Around. And I didn't talk about that much because I figured like those videos were already a good enough um, autopsy of how the growing around situation happened. Yeah. But, um, you know, mine was more focused on like, this is a, you know, like this is a very sad man. <laughs> Who hurt you, John? Who hurt you? <laughs> but the thing is, uh, your work does not stop there. 
because apart from like telling people about this thing and how it like petered out and how it's like lost in like creative limbo we uh, as creators like you brought me into this today we are going to say all right well how do you not fall into the same pitfalls as mr enter how do you look at growing around and succeed. Um, I got a comment on my Mr. Enter video from somebody called Boom Blastabot, which I thought was a really good comment, and I thought that this was a great... The reason I wanted to do this on your channel instead of mine is because I think that your viewers would get a lot out of this. Because I know, you know, you and Henry put out your writing advice. Mm. So I figured, instead of two professional writers, it's one professional writer, one professional animator. Yeah, it's it's uh, two... two the, the last two brain cells of the internet try to parse this, is what this yeah. video is. Um, so the, uh, the, the question that I got asked was, re reaching the conclusion, I can't help but wonder how I can avoid going through the pitfalls pitbull of this show's development when making my own passion projects. And that's a really great question. And I think that, like... Yeah, I wanted I want to address that because I didn't take the time to to really talk about it. Cause at the time I made that video, like Tooth or Dare wasn't out. Mm. I didn't want to do the thing that Enter like sometimes does. That I remember him. I remember him doing it a lot, like talking, and he and he still does it, talking about uh, growing around as if it is like an extant television pilot yeah exactly um like there would be a lot of points in his older videos that i like specifically remember that were like um to anybody who's saying you can't judge this because you couldn't write any better i can and i have <laughs> and when i watched that at the time i was like oh that's great for him he must be shopping the it, naively stupidly i thought he must be shopping the pilot uh, like around he must have like made it and like he's sending it to studios no <laughs> Viewer, he was not. Stu studios aren't like, <laughs> studios wouldn't be able to make his vision come to life. No, he has since like denounced studios and like the whole idea of making a pilot. But then I don't know what he's going to do because he also refuses to shorten any of the scripts. Yeah, okay. So let's let's break this down. Let's break this down piece by piece because, you know, I know a lot of the people in the audience of this channel, a lot of you are animators, a lot of you are aspiring writers, like a lot of you like, you know, do this stuff or are looking how to do this stuff. I think the one thing that we've brought up so far that like makes a lot of sense is Mr. Enter by like thinking that like whatever he does can't be done by a studio he's automatically closing off that train. And that's fine. We know, because we've done a whole season of Less is More, that, like, what we're doing yeah. would not work through the studio lens, or at, at the least it would, like, limit our vision. But we still made it. And, you know, we'll get more into how we made that using that and uh, Tooth or Dare as, a case study, as case studies yes. as we go forward. But first things first, decide if you want to work with studios or not. But don't, like, mm. don't, like mm. ascribe so much time to, like the people who are preventing you from doing the thing. I think that's going to be a recurring yes. pattern. <laughs> yes. I think the biggest advice that I could give uh, somebody who, oh, and actually the reply to this comment, somebody other than me, I replied with like, yeah, I might cover this in a follow-up. In, in then another person, um, Space Cadet Kaito said, I think the main thing that comes to mind with Mr. Enter is that he completely refuses one of the most common examples of writing advice, which is kill your darlings. Sometimes there is something that you love in a story, but it would just not work or is superfluous, and you would have to cut it out for the sake of, sake of the story's quality, even if you like it. But if I recall correctly, Mr. Enter has once said that he, if he scraps any work ever, then he feels like a complete waste, so he refuses to do it. He uh. completely ignores the fact that the promise will not work, at least not the way he wants it to, and he refuses to overhaul it or scrap it and move on. Which leads us to where we are now, where he spent six years working on a project that has zero chance of being made instead of coming up with something that has more potential. And that's my, that basically sum up, sums up my, my biggest piece of advice. Um, if you want to get, like, a passion project off the ground, be as, like, not precious about it as you can stand being. I, I feel that I do have to address Mr. Enter is autistic. I think that, like, I don't want this to come across as, like, uh, a neurotypical person saying it. So, I, uh, full disclosure, on the table, I have ADHD. I've been off my medication for about a year. Mm. I understand a lot of the same things that Mr. Enter is going through because ADHD and autism share, like, um, incredible amount of overlap in symptoms with those two uh, neurological conditions. So I relate to a lot of the things that he says about, like, you know, his sort of drive for perfectionism, his, like, 
his rigidity on certain things. I totally understand that. But you need to recognize, like, creative shortcomings in yourself, whether they are, like, things that you could potentially overcome or things that you're just going to have to work around due to, you know, mental illness, neurodivergence. For me, for me personally, and, like, you know, I'm just going to also say... Uh, I have Asperger's. I've, like, lived with that my whole life since I was, like, sort of basically diagnosed with it in second grade. And yeah, for me, it has kind of affected the creative process because it's hard to... It is difficult to, like, you know, see your work and what you're doing now as separate things. This is a problem that a lot of people on the internet have. They equate, like, they there's such a pushback against, like, any kind of advice. Because it's like, if you don't let me be unhappy, that's ableism. Yeah. Man. Like, you know, um... <laughs> I think there's, like, a difference between, like, giving someone, like, the space to live as they are and, you know, accommodating that. But also, when we're talking about production and art, you need to still be productive or realize that maybe if if it's too much for you then come back to it at a later time take a step back no i mean like early on in less is more look early on in less mm. is more i was like i had never worked on like a group collaborative creative mm. project and i get like i'm an inc people will anybody who's worked with me on a creative project will tell you that i am like so aggressive yeah. <laughs> i'm like a really aggr i'm so aggro uh a lot of the time about like particularly with like creative things like i've i have um i've s i think i said in the um i was on like a pod tales panel about writing in a writer's room for podcasts and i think i think they have me on record saying that i think that i am one of the worst people on less is more to work with out of the nine i of mean us. because sometimes <laughs> Sometimes I'm just, like, in early on in Less is Morgue, I'd never worked in a creative project. And I'm such, like, cre I'm I'm like Mr. Enter. Like, naturally, I am such a control freak when it comes to my ideas. Like, everything has to be exactly the way that it was mm. in my head. And I, it's been such a process to, to learn how to not be like that. And early on in Less is Morgue, calls when we would have like writing calls when we were when we were writing the pilot if i suggested a joke that other people in the room shot down i would mute my microphone and oh. go cry for like 20 minutes and i would be like so angry that i would like for the rest of the day i'm like oh, fuck fuck them fuck them I'm, I'm never speaking to them again i hate them i hate less is morgue and then the next you know and then I, and then i'd like drink some water and go take a nap and then i'd be fine oh my god but, <laughs> Like, I would get so worked up, and over time, I have just had to, like, I have, I've, I've developed a system for how to, uh, sort of, I think, writing episode 13 of Less is More was, like, therapy mm. for me, because basically, I'm, I'm Riley. And if you've listened to that episode, that's the one where Shaz and Mari are giving Riley writing advice, and Riley is, uh, taking it really, really bad. And uh, I basically wrote that as, like, me yelling at myself. <laughs> well, a lot of this is, like, fascinating to hear because I really do think that you've come a long way in regards to this. Like, mm. throughout the process of the show. So it, is, it is possible. That's what I'm trying to say here is that it is possible. Like, if you are if you are a neurodivergent person who wants to create things and you want to work in a group environment, if you want to work in, a, like, if you want to produce something as a group, um, if you want to, like... But but you're looking at Mr. Enter and being like, that's going to end up being me. That doesn't have to be how it is. <laughs> I think definitely the group atmosphere does, like, help that. Because, you know, much like you said with the example with, like, you know, Riley being confronted by Murray and Chaz, you're forced to, like, allow other people into the room. You're forced to take their ideas into consideration. And for me, too, although, like, you know, I'm a little more, like, internal about it. I have, like, some, like, control freak tendencies, too. And I think it stems back to yeah. uh, being, like, a Dungeons & Dragons player. Because this is not true of mm. all Dungeons & Dragons players. But, like, I got into DMing initially because I was so unsatisfied with the DMs I had. And I was so, oh, like... Yeah. I was so, <laughs> like... Ugh. If only they, like, if only they did things this way. If only they gave my character more agency. And then I was like, oh, I know. I'll just control the yeah. world. And, um, you know, I don't fully think that way anymore. I definitely think that Dungeons, playing, like, playing D&D &D and um, Vampire the Masquerade to a much lesser extent. I have a weekly D&D &D mm. group, but I've, 
Um, I and I tried to start a weekly thing with Charlie and Henry at one point to play Vampire, and oh. it fell apart <laughs> pretty quickly. But I still still have my game book yeah. for it. But um, yeah, like tabletop gaming has definitely gotten me better at like collaboration because you know you have the yes and. If if the other players want the game to go one way, but you don't want it to go that way, you kind of just have to roll with it. Yeah, exactly. Like for me, I got better through a combination of working on Less Is Morgue, you know, and, and doing the whole writers' room thing, and also you know switching into a player role uh, in the past year, and and like learning how things are on the other side, and you know being able to like see what behaviors that like I would not like me to be doing on the other side of the dm window uh it's it's all a learning experience and like honestly i i consider like our working dynamic when we were writing our you know our own mysterious pilot that will be talked about a little bit more later this month i think that uh we worked really well together and it's because of these lessons that we took from this uh ongoing experience no i mean like into a beginning of 20 uh like beginning middle of 2019 when we first started when we when like less is more when it was in its like infancy hadn't we hadn't even announced it yet but like w- mid 2019 meg would have uh, called you some very mean <laughs> names uh, <laughs> in in the uh in if we had tried to make our project together at that point in my life i would have said very unkind things that i didn't mean because i do get i i get so i get funny about my concepts but i'm i am learning to loosen the reins a little bit and that's something that i think i mean mid 2019 gus probably would have been like fuck it i'm just gonna do it myself i can't trust anybody i am like the supreme i'm the best and nobody can can like get in my way like it's and it's all just ego like that is something that's yeah that's the other thing that you have to um be really wary about when it comes to um making like if you want to make an animation pilot or anything uh if you want to start on your passion projects if you find if you are in a position where like you uh you know don't know people that could help you out with it you don't have the money to hire other talent um or you know you're you're not skilled enough yourself um no like play to your strengths creatively Mm. like i feel that mr enter um, that Mr. John Enter should continue on the plot, the the path of like writing novels of growing around, because I think writing is what he is the most passionate about doing. I think part of the reason he wanted to make it animated is just, well, I'm an animation YouTuber, so I should do that. But like, he doesn't animate himself. He is a definitely more on the writer side of things. So I think that if he started releasing them as books, I think that would be something, mm. you know? Yeah, so it's, I guess, uh, to, to you know, to take that kernel of advice, it's pick a medium that fits your, like, level of skill and, like, your yeah. uh, current resources. Because for us, Less is Morgue became an audio drama mostly because we had access to, like, you yeah, and Lexi because, yeah, as we voice know a lot actors, of, uh... and we had, like, sound designers, yeah. and basically, like... Everybody who worked on the show was either like a writer or a voice actor alumni from uh, Congeria, and that's kind of how we all met. Yeah, either Congeria, the Alexandria archives, or no yeah. sleep. So we had like this clear, like, okay, we can make an audio drama, and it won't take an exorbitant amount of time or bringing in new talent that like we need to like, you know, stress test. Yes, and that brings yes. me to like. Another thing that Mr. Enter does that I think we avoided and all people should try to avoid. And it's this putting Kickstarter and similar like crowdfunding things on this pedestal that if you meet your goal, your thing is as good as finished. Yeah. No, that's like, and and, like to go even beyond Mr. Enter, remember that like golden period of like 2014 to like, I, I would say like 2013 to 2016 where every fucker on Tumblr.com 
like found a shit post, drew a yeah. picture, yeah. and was like, "Give me ten thousand dollars, and I'll make this as a cartoon." Yeah. No, literally, it's like Kickstarter <laughs> is just—it's a money funnel. It's a trap. I mean, Indiegogo more than Kickstarter because Kickstarter doesn't let you keep the money if you if um you don't hit your that's, goals. But th- Indiegogo no, that's does. fair. There's become there's new tech yeah. that's been developed to make this an even more unfair process over the years. But like. Yeah. It's one of these things where not only has the goodwill of platforms like this been, like, worn out in, like, the communities that are expecting things from it, it also conflates, like, vast sums of money with, you know, the skill level needed to create these things. Because, like, the, the having the money isn't the be-all and end-all of it, because you're gonna have to then use that money to hire people. Yeah, like, you, you need, like, someone with knowledge of, like, either headhunting or, like, where the money should be allocated if it's, like, in terms of supplies or, like, uh, programs or just, like, studio space. Like, you need somebody who has the know-how. And for us, we got that know-how from working on, like, uh, previous projects before, and we picked up a lot of the skills on the fly. Like, I think if, um, if Mr. Enter really, like, like, I, you know, I fully agree with your statement that he should do books, but if he, like, really wanted to make something animated, he could try to learn animation, like, himself. He clearly thinks about it a lot. Yeah, and to his credit, to his credit, in uh, the, um, Enter the Enterverse video, I think it's called, an, I think it's actually called Announcing the Enterverse, but I like to call it Enter the Enterverse, because that's, you know, repetition's exactly. funny. But in that video, he said that he's got an Instagram, and he is going to be posting his own drawings on it, so he is learning how to see, draw. There, see, there you go. He might be learning animation software on the sidelines. One day, he might be able to do it. Uh, good on him for that. That's a correct exactly. decision. It's never too late to pick up new skills unless you've already, like, basically funneled all of your money and time and emotional investment into the thing that you haven't made because you didn't have the skills previously. But in the future, if you attain the skills, you can undo all of that by having it exist. Or you could go with, like, something completely new. I think yeah. in a in a broader sense, when people think, oh, well, I need some benevolent higher power whether it's like a studio or a group of fans that give me funding or like just some person with the resources i need someone else to approve of this project to put all their money into it and us as like the ideas people will just do our idea and the rest of the money will just be handled by whatever power controls it okay so to mirror this with my own like process of making an animated pilot. I do have a like storyboarded and voice acted pilot for Urban Creatures. It is not available to view publicly, but Gus, I will give you permission to use B-roll from it just to prove that it exists. Um, I haven't posted it publicly on my YouTube channel because because I don't know if I'm gonna be shopping it to like studios or if I'm going to be getting a grant to finish it myself. But some TV studios, like particularly uh, Comedy Central. Uh, don't let you submit pilots that have already been in circulation. They need you to, like, keep it secret. Yes. Because I wanted, I still wanted, like, I wanted something that I could share with people. I wrote a two-minute, or uh, I think it's, I think it's bang on three minutes, actually. I wrote a three-minute long mini pilot, which is Tooth or Dare, which is a short film that's on my YouTube channel right now. And uh, it has all of the same voice actors that I have used for the proper Urban Creatures pilot. And, uh, well, when I say all of the voice actors, I mean me and Rob. Camille's in it, but she doesn't have any lines. Uh, Even though I love Eden, I would like to make another one of these animations and include her in it this time. But, um, yeah, so, and, and that is, that's what I did. And Mr. Renter in one of his, like, um, thoughts about growing around or, like, growing around retrospective videos, he said, I quoted this in my video that I made about growing around, he said that asking a writer to write a script that is shorter than a minute is like asking an artist to write a stick, uh, to draw a stick figure. And that's just not anything. No. Because, like, one of the skills that you need to be a good writer is to, like, 
effectively convey information in as few words as possible. Like, somebody in the comments uh, gave the example of, this guy's never heard of baby shoes for sale, never yeah. worn. That's six words that conveys all of the information you need to tell a complete story. And, you know, sometimes longer stories are good, but sometimes shorter stories are better. And it's all on how you use the language. And if you can't command the language... I don't know if... I don't think Mr. Enter can't command the language well enough to, like, make a short story. I think he just won't. Yeah, I think it's just a personal, like, bias towards, like, I need it to be this length. But yeah, what you're saying is so true, because, like, in, in script writing especially, and, like, I'd say this is true of Less is More, but also true of, like, scripts I've made with both you and with uh, Henry Galley, individual lines being, like as 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 tight and self-explanatory as possible is so important to the point that like a script built on like good one singular lines that convey everything they need to about like how to advance to the next one is really all you need you just persist until the story has been completely told no more no less like there is no yeah. need for padding and when i look at like length I can only think of, like, oh, like, if someone insists on a longer length, they don't know how to edit. They need to learn that skill. And it all kind of comes back to the point that I made of, like, as as much as you can not be precious about your projects, don't be precious. If you have to shorten it, shorten it. If you have to do it in a different medium, do it in a different medium. Just do whatever is the most reasonable and realistic for you. Mm. Also, another piece of advice that I would give is don't throw all of your energy into, like, your big passion project. Have something on the side. Because I think it's hard, it's harder to divorce your, like, your self-worth from what you're working on when you don't have, like, more than one iron in the fire. Like, I have, I've got Urban Creatures. Um, I've also got... The secret project that I'm working on with guests. Yeah. I've also got like tabletop campaigns that I'm writing. I've got like a couple of um, ideas for like audio drama podcasts that might come out someday in the future, kicking around in the back of my head. I've got Less is Morgue, which I write and voice act for. Like, obviously, like, uh, Urban Creatures is kind of that's my passion project. That's it's uh, based on a comic strip that I used to draw when I was in like grade 10. Mm. Yeah, I used to post on Drunk Duck, but then I moved it to Smack Jeeves. And I I went back to my Smack Jeeves page, and I was devastated because all of the, like, custom coding that I'd made when I was in high school is gone now. Oh, no. That... <laughs> I spent so long making my own, like, custom HTML for my webcomic, and it's all gone now. That reminds me of, um, there was a time when, like, I, uh, I posted Naruto fanfiction. In high school, I posted Naruto fanfictions to, like, fan forums. And because of the reformatting of, like, these forums over the years and how they kind of decayed and, like, lost members, uh, mine were lost in the shuffle of the archiving and, like, permanently deleted at a certain point due to inaction. Oh, and I just oof. lost a ton of writing that I wasn't smart enough to, like, save separately at a time. Like, on the side. So there's just a, a portion of, like, my early formative writing career that I have no access to. And it sucks. Wow. <laughs> I was gonna say, too, uh, the thing about the thing about Enter is that, you know, like, like yourself, you know, I have my Dire Gentleman YouTube channel, which you're watching. Yeah. I have Less is Morgue. I have a big tabletop campaign that's been running for years. And I have the, the secret project that, that will be talked about later in Junth. Thing is, not only did Mr. Enter put so much into growing around and fixate on it, uh, he wrote so many extra scripts. Like, he did so much busy work. Yeah, he did so much. Did not help him make one episode or even plan, like, like one season. Like, there was, there's just, I think the advice here is do not overwork yourself on extraneous things in regard to the project. Focus first and foremost on making any part of it that you can get public. When you have an idea for a series, you write the pilot and then if that pilot is optioned by a television network or a streaming service or what have you, then you 
get to write other episodes. But it's generally not a good idea to write a bunch before the show is picked up because the studio might want to bring in other writers. They might uh, ask you to change a few things. So if you've written a bunch of stuff like in the continuity where the pilot exists as you wrote it originally, you're going to have to scrap a lot of your other work. It's like, um, like a good example of this is Has Been Hotel. Has Been Hotel, uh, we, we on the Dire Gentleman channel, uh, kind of think of it as it's got good bones, but it's not the best thing in the world. Yeah, we're a little critical of the pilot, but out of love. Yeah, so A24, they've purchased that pilot. They are probably going to be doing heavy script edits, bringing in more writers, uh, you know, editors, and when it's ready to be released to the public, they're probably going to make another pilot that is very different from the one that we saw from Vivzy Pop's YouTube channel. Mm. It's the same thing with, like, one of my favorite TV shows ever, Being Human, had a pilot that was released with a completely different cast. Literally, they recast everybody between the pilot and the official first episode. And that's, you know, it's it's very common for, like, because a pilot, what a pilot is, is a, um, basically, like, an advertisement for an idea. It, it's used to show what a show like this could look like. Exactly. So, I'm gonna pivot to a different industry, but a similar concept. Like, when it comes to, like, shonen manga, like, in the big mag magazines, like, uh, Weekly Shonen Jump, typically authors will do a one shot, which is like a pilot. And that will like basically show the like concept of their world and carry out like a story from head to toe. And you can see like, they're very available. The Naruto one piece and bleach pilots, like the one shots, very different from the work, but each of those were picked up. And then from that point on, it's okay. Yeah. You week to week work on these things. And if the thing didn't get picked up, you don't want to be in the position where it's like, wait, no, I just spent 10 years of my life doing Naruto, but Naruto didn't get picked up. Like, we don't live in that universe, but if you can imagine what would happen if Kishimoto had, like, a hundred chapters of Naruto ready and the magazine didn't take it, that's the position that Enter is in when he's sitting on, like, these 80-plus scripts. Well, it's, 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 it's more than 80 plus scripts. It's like fucking, I guess I was, it's, it's like a hundred something. Geez. It's a hundred and I think it's a hundred and I was lowballing it. I was being generous with 80 plus. There are, there are shows like, like primetime drama shows that don't have that many episodes that have been running for like five so seasons. So this personally bothers me because of a specific way that like my neurodivergency manifests. Like I would kill for that level of, like, productivity. But the problem is, it's all towards, like, all of the productivity, like, the, the, the like, being so prolific in writing these scripts, it's all being completely misused. Like, imagine if Enter or any of us could focus, like, a fraction of that effort and that dedication to create that many scripts to something that could be real, something that could, like, work out, you know? Yeah, exactly. I have not written that much in my life, I think. No. <laughs> no. no. I mean, how could you? It's a bonkers amount. Like, I, and I'm not speaking to, like, you know, I'm not speaking to the quality of this. Like, I, I know you've seen some of these things and you've, you've had your thoughts on how these go. Yeah, I've, I've seen some of your older writing. Yeah, well, I wasn't saying my older writing, but but uh, the, the entry scripts, but yeah, a lot of my older writing. Oh no, oh fuck, yeah. <laughs> no, I've read uh, I've read two of them, and uh, they're, they're so much. Yeah, uh, like, and again. And I'm just, I don't understand how he got 170 uh, ideas. Out of this, yeah, I just and the scripts, the scripts average about 20 pages each. Yeah. I don't know. Like, it, it, I don't know how he's able to get, like, that much out of the concept. Because, like, we have a concept that has, like, an incredibly broad, like, world-building thing. Mm. Which is, you know, uh, the Urban Creatures Less is More cinematic universe. Yeah. Which is, the, the whole concept is just, like, it's exactly like the real world, except, 
all of this, like, bullshit urban fantasy horror stuff is real. And we can write an episode of Less is More that is only 15 minutes long. I mean, hell, I made in that, con- in that, in, within that universe with, like, its sumptuous world building, not to butt pat myself too much, or butt pat all of us <laughs> too much. It, uh, I wrote a, I wrote a, uh, three minute long animated short. Hmm. <laughs> Set in that world. I didn't need to, like, spend all my time on the uh, intricacies of world building. It's just, mm, Murray gets his tooth broken. That's it. That's all that happens. I think Enter might confuse the act of, like, figuring out, oh, what if this happens in this world? What about this? And then thinking each of those ideas might be its own thing rather than just something yeah, you think about. Yeah, not every, uh, not every, like, scenario sort of needs to happen. Little, little world building thought that you have is enough for an episode. Exactly. And that's, listen, this is also advice for people who want to, uh, sell, sell script ideas to less is more. Yes. Yes. Because a lot of the pitches that we've got are just like, what if this happened in the less is more universe? And we're like, could you really get... I don't think you could get 15 minutes of content out of that. <laughs> There's a lot of, like, um, parsing, like, world-building details, like, introducing concepts or, like, trying to elaborate on stuff. And, like, what we do in each individual episode of Less is More is that we tell a self-contained story. They, there can be elements that, like, overlap into other things. And I will say, like, just, you know, earlier, it's not like um, we advocate for doing... No work going forward, but with Less yeah. is Morg, we just knew that it wasn't a pilot format. We knew that, like, we could, you know, write a pilot. We could just make it. Test yeah. it, and then just, like, write as many scripts as we could. We basically yeah. wrote most of season one before we started airing episode one because we just wanted to make sure that the release schedule would be consistent and yes. that the characters were, like, well-known enough, the world was well-fleshed out, and the overarching story was, like, familiar enough to us before the show uh, got out there. But there is such a thing as getting too familiar with your characters because that leaves no room open for them to grow or to change. Yeah, it's, it's, it is like you, you restrain yourself. When you do too much writing work, you restrain yourself because people... And this is something that I've, like, I have also experienced with Less is More and Urban Creatures because um, Urban Creatures, even though it predates... It technically predates Less is Morgue. It is kind of like a spinoff of Less is Morgue because mm. they take place in the same universe. Like, these, uh, the main three characters of Urban Creatures, uh, Camille, Shaz, Mari, they all have, like, nigh on a decade worth of, like, head cannons and world building mm. put into them because I've been drawing these characters since I was a child. And, um,. But, like, it was a, it's a weird experience, like, kind of coming into it. And people will be like, I think this should happen with them. And I'm, I'm like, on the one hand, I'm like, oh, that's so cool that other people are, like, engaging with my, uh, with my creative uh, creations. But then on the other hand, it's like, oh, no, my carefully crafted world building. What will I do? Yeah, it's... it's... <laughs> and you kind of have to, like, when you're working in a collaborative setting, if you have, like, an idea in your head about, like, how something in your fictional world is going to work or, like, a scene that you really want to play out and somebody suggests doing it a little bit differently, be open. For me, I've had some characters that, like, I've had since childhood that I brought into, like, my D&D campaign like, one, one, for example, there was this character I had, and it dated back to, like, home videos I made with my brother. There was a character named Pig Number One, and he had this sidekick named Joseph, who was just one of those, like, 90s crazy bones. Oh, and yeah! Those little, like, mo- the little, like, plastic guys plastic, with the faces? Oddly shaped. Yeah, like, so there was one I of those. I didn't know you had those in America. I thought they were an Aussie thing. I thought, like, Moose Toys made them. There there are some, and we also got, like, jumbo-sized ones from McDonald's. So this was one of those. It was, like, a huge-ass, like, skull. And so the two of these guys in in their original sort of home movie universe would fly around in, like, a toy Kaiba's blimp from Yu-Gi-Oh! and cause mischief. Beautiful. And so 
when I updated them into like D and D, uh, you know, I, I at first thought of like, oh, these will be silly one-off villains. But one of my players got like really attached to them as like characters and wanted them to like, you know, develop. So suddenly pig number one had an entire redemption arc in front of him where he went from like bog standard, like team rocket villain to a guy who's like trying to work on his life and, and become like, you know, a, be like a person. Mm. It's just, it's just interesting. Cause you never know how people are going to react to the characters until they engage with them. And that's, I think the part that enter like, and creators who, who feel this way, it that's behavior to work on because yeah, it is. If, if you're like thinking like, Oh, well these things are perfectly great as they are. And the audience will just either dislike them or the audience that I want will like be like, ah, I get exactly what he was going for. I like this. Like yeah. to think that there will be no speculation to think that like people won't expect different things of characters or see different things in them that you weren't expecting. That is it's being, as you said, too precious. And I think if you pre do all of your work of your stories, all of your work of your character development, you miss out on the possibility of changing them in ways you never expected and developing in them ways that weren't initially in the plan. And uh, when you've done a first draft of something, get another pair of eyes on it Mm. because they will spot things that you didn't even think about. Like Gus and Henry have been helping me um, workshop a screenplay that I wrote based on one of my no sleep stories called the open secret of East hall. Mm. Um, And uh, because I want to, you know, one of the first things I want to do once I'm out of quarantine is start, sending this script to film festivals because mm. i think I, it's gonna be pretty good when it's done but i wrote a first draft of it a couple years ago didn't touch it for a while went back to it and uh once again henry had suggestions and i was aggro about it yeah. for a little bit <laughs> i was like screaming and like how dare you i can't cut this part this this is a good bit. Mm. And, but then like after a lot of, um, inevitably I, I go through the phase of like, uh, lashing out, then crying, then having a snack and maybe a little sleep. And then I'm fine. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like a three year old. Well, but um, the thing is, but the thing is, you know, you have, um, you have Henry and you have yeah. like, you know, this, you get through it. Like you've, you've yeah. found a way to realize like, at the end of the day, what matters is the creative project, is your passion being as like polished and as uh, as as good as you could possibly make it, and um, that's what should carry us through. Yeah, I would have. I yeah. So I um like I made a lot of like a lot heavy edits. Like the first dra- the first draft and the second draft of the East Hall screenplay are unrecognizable from each other. Like there's a whole whole new like plot structure entirely. But then, like, Gus and Henry have been looking at it together uh, with me. And, Gus, you've you've come up with some things that I, like, didn't even consider. Mm. Like, they, like my brain just, like, didn't know that those possibilities existed. Um, even if it's not, like, even if it's something like a novel that you're working on, like, if that's your real passion project, let somebody else look at it before mm. you release it to the public. Because bringing in like diverse points of view is always going to be good for the final product. Yes. Like, there is a point where you get like too many cooks in the kitchen, but if you have like one or two or maybe three people look at different versions of the story, they'll be able to come at it from different angles. And uh, this is some specific advice that I would give to people making something like um, what Mr. Enter was making with growing around. It's good to get perspectives that are like related to the topic that you're writing about. Like, I mean, if, if, uh, Mr. Renter had shown, like, an early version of Growing Around to, like, some parents or teachers or people who, you know, work with children closely and understand how children talk, you know, they could be like, you know, oh, kids don't talk like that. Kids, you know, kids are more like this, you know, like, this is a a better way to write a child character. You know, that would be useful. And, like, for me, because my, my, uh, the screenplay set in an American university, I went to university in Australia and then, uh, grad school here in the UK. Um, I really want to make sure that I get Scott's eyes on this at some point because he's a uni RA in the States. So uh, he'd be able to, and I've had like a few other 
American friends look at it and be like, oh yeah, no, we don't have that at our colleges here. Like, Meg, you're, you're forgetting that the drinking age is 21 in this country. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of that. That was a big criticism that came over a lot. <laughs> yeah. We, like, listen, we don't know why it's so high, but it just is, okay? It just is. It just is. <laughs> I think this, this all hits on, like, you know, sometimes you just need, like, you know, outside perspective. People who have knowledge related to the topic, like, Better than research, which you should also do, is getting people whose life experience applies to the thing that you're doing so that your yeah. characters can reflect that experience in and of themselves. Uh, that's why sensitivity readers are important. And I yeah, think... absolutely. I think in general, like, to take all of the bits and pieces, the whole, like, you know, don't rely on some like you know benefactor that's like detached from you fundamentally like don't um do like you know too much busy work yourself don't disappear into like the rabbit hole of uh one passion project it all comes down to whatever you're doing creatively don't do it alone if you can help yeah it. yeah and if you know if you don't have if you're one of these people who's like oh but i don't have friends you know, th those come up in the comments. Yes. You can find people online. There are writing forums, you know, uh, Facebook groups. You can find, yeah, you can find places online. I met Henry and Meg because uh, I made YouTube videos and Henry saw one of my YouTube videos and reached out to me. Like, that's not going to happen 100% of the time. But if you put yourself out there creatively at first, whether it's through, like, you know, courses, like now that COVID, you know, if everyone gets vaccinated, you can go out and you can take courses. Cannot stress enough. Go get vaccinated. Go get vaccinated, please. But you can go out, you can take courses anywhere where you can like, you know, express e even like, I hesitate to say it, but like even a discord forum, as long as it's focused on like what you're looking to accomplish, what you're looking to do. Yeah. It's so difficult, you know, because I know that, uh, a lot of people struggle with making friends. Yeah, it's so, it's very hard to make friends as an adult. Because, like, the only the only adults that you ever interact with are people at your work. <laughs> and that's how it is. What I used to do, uh, what I used to do in, um, you know, back home in Sydney, uh, I was part of a group on Meetup, which was mm. the, like, weekly artists, like, art jam. I used to go to a weekly art jam uh, at a bar in the city and we would all just like get together on a Monday night and uh, sit around a table, have a pint and some food and draw together. And it was, it was great. And you can find, there are art jams that you can join. Like there are so many ways that you can meet other creative people. So if you, if you don't have, if you don't have friends, if you're going to say to us like, oh, I don't have friends. It is really hard to go out and meet people and, like, make friends. But if you have a shared interest in common, that makes it a little bit easier. Yeah, exactly. And, like, the thing, too, is that, like, the people that you're working with creatively don't have to be your, like, bestie best friends no. in the whole wide no. world from day one. But, you know, you can you can get, like, feedback from different people. And who knows? Maybe, like, you will develop, like, you know, colleagues who are also, like, close friends. It can happen. Uh, but separate the I need companionship drive from the I need to be f like creatively fulfilled drive. Yeah. Because mixing those two things, it doesn't do wonders for your self-worth all the time, unless you're really successful at it. It really doesn't. Okay, I think that we've about covered like our experience and uh, how to kind of avoid some of the pitfalls of Mr. Enter. Yeah. Did you have anything you wanted to no, add? No, uh, just watch Tooth or Dare, please. I worked really hard on it. Yes, watch only, Tooth or Dare. It's only got like 200 views at the moment, but... YouTube is so, YouTube's like... YouTube's so mean to short videos. Animators. Yeah. Animators deserve more credit and respect, yes. please. Can we give it to them? You know, if you like this video, if you leave a comment, if you subscribe to this channel, also watch Tooth or Dare. Thank you. Also go over and watch Tooth or Dare. Uh, it's right up here. You have no excuse. You literally, uh, I revoke your dire hard card if you don't You're give a it a If you do that, I, I dare say you are actually a dire soft and you were the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want, do you folks want to be soft or do you want to be hard? Do you want to be dire hard? Live free or dire hard? That's, that's uh, the motto of New Hamp Dire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, 
All right. So uh, thank you for watching, everybody. Uh, we will um, join you again soon, talking about new projects Hell and yeah. talking about Less is Morgue. Uh, in the meantime, subscribe and enjoy the rest of the monthly videos. Sorry, monthly, daily videos. Daily. They're coming out in this merry month. Yeah, junth, junth, baby. Junth it up. I'm the junth, baby. Junth, junth in the cack. Yeah. <laughs> Have you seen that video?